Hi, Chris Wiley here. Thanks for joining us today. We're just getting ready. We're going to allow about five minutes for everybody to get settled. Um, Ned, I think you and Ross and Sibo are the ones that are on right now. Um, excuse me, Elena, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great and clear, so go straight ahead. Perfect. I see uh, Taylor has joined us. And we'll stand by for a minute. Well, it takes about, typically takes about five minutes for everybody to get in. Can you see my screen okay now, Ellen? Yep, it's, uh, I can totally see your screen. It looks really good, so. Awesome. Is it distracting having the uh, header on at the top? Oh, there it goes. It's down now. And we'll stand by for the rest of the folks to join. Uh, Darren, I was describing to uh, Elena how she can see the chat at the bottom right side if uh, any of the team members have a question. Again, since the group today will be a number of our team members, I see a few more joining. Yep, and I can, um, I will monitor that, Chris, so you can focus on the material and then we can, you know, but if something comes up or at a pause, I will let you know if there's something critical. Good. All right. And by the way, Linda, when you're speaking, there's a bunch of squawking noises in the background, like paper or if like my wire hits my chin once in a while. Uh, might be something like that. But, uh, what I'm going to do real quick, oh, I'm going that's to. Weird. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. But I see somebody chatting. Oops. No, those are questions. All right. Uh, real quick while we're warming up, I'm going to unmute all for just a moment for a test. Attendees will have full audio and may mute themselves. So I'm going to unmute everybody, I think. Uh, Ned, can you hear me now? Elena, you can still hear me, right? Yes, I can. Yep. Yeah, I think everybody's just in listening mode. Thanks, you guys, for uh, joining us. Uh, we're going to continue. And we'll wait about five minutes to see if we can get a critical mass of folks on. It usually takes about five minutes to get everybody seated. So we'll stand by for them to join us. Ned is trying to out testing the questions. Oh. Hello. Hey. Who's How are you? joining us? This is Ray. Hey, Ray. How you doing? You are a panelist. <coughs> Thanks for joining us. I Did that, uh, so, I so we are, it's all friendlies on the line right now. And so as panelists, you and I and Elena and Darren can all talk to the audience and they're hearing everything we say right now as we kind okay. of warm up. Um, okay. the, uh, the audience, okay, uh, the audience is currently muted, and right now okay. we have uh, Ned and Pete, and Ross and Sebo and Taylor. Thanks, you guys, for okay. joining us. To, uh, and uh, for you guys that are joining us from our internal team, um, as we go through the polls, please answer the polls just as you are an operator. Uh, look at yourself as you're an operator or answer them in ways that you would imagine somebody in the audience asking them. Part of our goal today is to exercise all the polls and do a full walkthrough of all the talking points. So we're going to stand by for about topics, five minutes. Up. What are the topics uh, today, can you, primarily? Can you, yeah, can you see my screen, Ray, now on your computer? Uh, I, I can in just a second. Um, oh, okay. I was going to say they're at the bottom uh, of the screen. So. Well, it went away. I, can see I, I tabbed it. over to my email know. and it closed it. Uh, Why would it close? Um, is, I'm not sure. Um, let's see. You may you can just re-execute those same actions. If, let's see if it says you're still in. Um, it says, oh, you draw, uh, no, you're still there. It shows you're an active panelist. Um, you so might check your browser. Uh, it's not in my browser. Um, if you go down to your bottom, um, I don't know if you use a Mac or an Apple, but um, if you look at your bottom area, there should be a go to meeting. Uh, it's like a yeah, 
looks like it's okay, orange. See, oh, I think I see it. There, yeah, it looks like it's okay, doily. Yeah, so it's not sitting in the. Okay. No problem. I got it now. Yeah, Thank an you. orange doily going Sorry. on there. Awesome. No worries. No worries. Part of uh, everybody getting used to it. More fun to do it this way before we have, uh, you know, 200 people on it. <laughs> That's the goal for January, February, March, and April. And again, I'm going to stand by. Well, it's just about five minutes after we got a small group of our people on it. I'm not sure if we're going to have any other of our team members able to join. So we're just going to walk through the whole thing. And Ray, uh, for you and Elena, um, Elena knows the story pretty well because she's been working on it with me. Uh, but for you, feel free to comment as we go. Um, the uh, flow, if you can see the four bullets at the bottom, here's the process we're going to go through. Um, I'm going to set up each topic with a poll, and everybody will click with their mouses. So everybody have your mouses ready. Everybody can respond to the polls. And then based on that poll, uh, we may adjust our talking points a little bit. But we'll talk through uh, first, you know, why you should never stop building restaurants. Uh, what is the what the drivers are from the tax perspective? The government wants you to do it. A lot of compelling reasons to do it. We're going to talk through uh, the fast casual revolution, what that really is, and why alcohol has become a tipping point uh, for operators in this space. Um, we'll talk about the battle for locations and how uh, build the suit partnerships can change the opportunity for you, and also how having multiple brands in the same market can help. Um, the uh, last topic we'll touch on uh, social media marketing, and really the because the topic there is what you don't know will hurt you. And my goal for each of the four topics is to give everybody a couple of takeaways that they can think about over the holidays that how they would you know embrace these ideas as they go into January. Um, just for fun, uh, I think Elena, I described to you how um, as an as the uh, at the control panel level, I can see when somebody is or is not actively engaged. Uh, I can see, for example, there you go, Ross popped back in. Uh, I see Ned doing something else. So what happens is if the go-to webinar screen is not your primary screen, it gives me an alert so I can tell if I'm losing the audience's attention. So Ned, it appears that the webinar is not your primary application. Uh, <laughs> now Pete looks like we might have lost it. Pete was on, oops, oh, now Ned's paying attention. <laughs> okay, well, tell you what, let's, uh, let's jump into it. Uh, I think we have the small enough group to get us going. Uh, Ray, thanks for joining us. Uh, Ray is the CEO of Rapid Fire Pizza. Um, our organization, Wiley Development Group, is a store operating company. Wiley Development is myself and my brother Peter, my son Ross, and a number of other team members. And our mission is to build and develop stores. So we're going to talk about things from our perspective. Um, we're joined today uh, by Darren Nicholson. Darren Nicholson uh, is with iPorit. They're one of our uh, vendor partners that we're really excited to work with. And uh, Darren, you're on the line, right? Greetings. I am here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Darren's going to chime in. Uh, this is a preview event. We're going to touch on each topic for uh, less than 15 minutes, try to give you a couple of quick takeaways. Uh, and then coming in January, February, um, March, uh, and April, uh, we will have events where, in the case of Darren, he's going to take the uh, uh, fast casual dimension of alcohol and do a deep dive with us and talk about a lot of things you need to know. Um, we're going to have uh, Steve Brockman, who's been our CPA for many years. He speaks at our uh, franchisee conferences, and he's going to uh, talk about how to take advantage of the tax incentives. Today, I'm going to tell you what they are. And uh, we'll have a guest, uh, I believe we might have Kelly step in, but uh, or another partner, uh, to talk about uh, locations and what's going on in that space and how to compete. And then uh, Matt Platt, who runs our social media platform, is going to join us uh, to talk about uh, what you don't know will hurt you, uh, building on topics that he published in his book called Don't 86 Your Restaurant. So with that, I'm going to go on to the, uh, the very next thing is uh, let's talk about excuse me, uh, my perspective. Um, my view of this is I'm building and operating stores. Uh, like everybody else in the business, cost controls are everything. And if I'm running million-dollar stores, and that's my goal, is to have my businesses be million-dollar locations, then a 1% miss on food cost or labor cost is worth $10,000 per year per store. We spend all of our time focusing on those very obvious cost problems. Uh, food costs, labor costs. What I'm going to talk about today is really about the owner's point of view and the operating the business point of view and how these topics below, tax incentives, 
alcohol, uh, battle for locations, and social media can materially change your bottom line. A, give you more breathing room, and B, much more efficiently use your capital and your expenses. So uh, let's jump into it. We're going to use the first poll to see if I can pull this off effectively. And here it is on the screen. So if you guys could all join me and exercise your mouse fingers. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if Darren, if you and Ray can see these. So for our attendees that I see out in the audience, um, if you guys could please click on the poll, pick the option that best describes what your perspective is today. Whether you're coming at this as a store operator, if you're in a multi-store business, if you're a multi-brand operator, um, or if uh, you're just an investor in stores and not actually an operator. Um, I see that about 40% uh, of the people voted. Uh, for you guys that haven't, if you could click away on the uh, screen. Oh, we're up to 80%. We only have one holdout. Uh, everybody voted? Oh, wait just a second more to get the last one in. One more person. There's always one holdout. Close the poll and share the results. So. This is what the audience looks like today. And I use this so that we can adjust our talking points a little bit. Um, for example, today I don't see any folks that are pure play investors. Uh, so everybody on here except for, well, the first couple groups are multi-store or multi-brand operators. Looks like we have some folks in the audience that are new to franchising. So I'll try to talk about this as, you know, how you might look at making investments in restaurant franchising. Um, we have found that we have literally had potential franchisees uh, referred to us uh, uh, by their financial advisors, by their CPAs, to tell them they should consider investing in restaurants. Um, as we uh, move on to the next slide in just a moment, uh, what I want to talk about is why you want to or why you want to continually build stores. And Ray told me this story years ago that the key to his success was never stop building, continuously moving forward. Well, the benefits of that are obvious for you guys that are operating. Leveraging or doing more stores continues to leverage your existing operating overhead. It gives you more density in your market so you get better advertising efficiency. It creates a growth path for your people. And that's you know, one of the most challenging things we have to deal with in this business is retaining great management. And if you are always building stores in your market, in the eyes of the real estate community and the landlords and the advertising, counterparties, you really get more and more control. I think uh, Ray said that one article written where they call him the restaurant king of Dayton was because you had multiple brands in the Dayton market. But the challenge with that is uh, most operators become landlocked. Um, if you're in a single brand and you've built out your market, uh, for example, I believe Ray was a, a subway operator in the early days. Well, you can only put so many subways in town. You're limited in how many you can build and you're limited in how far you're willing to drive. And if you're only willing to drive an hour to deal with a store that has a problem, that's pretty much defined your market. So I, we like to call that the 50 mile rule. Uh, what I'd like to do here is talk about how we solve that. And the way we solve that is diversify some multiple brands. Um, about uh, a decade ago, uh, Ray and his partners developed the Hothead Burritos brand and then about three years ago, they developed Rapid Fire. But the reason that's so important is that uh, working within, let's call it the 50-mile radius, which I kind of depicted on these slides, Ray was able to bring hotheads into a market where he knew the landlords and put the hotheads adjacent to his subways or near to those subways. And, and even in a cooperative arrangement with some of those, uh, those landlords who knew them very well and even did kind of build a scooter partnership type opportunity. If you diversify to multiple brands within your market, now you have the opportunity to go deep in that market, to truly uh, take advantage of your real estate relationships, your developer relationships, and your personnel can get much more efficient. So what this is really a setup for is that the tax incentives we're going to talk about in a second are giving you all the reason in the world to build more stores faster, you get all of those efficiencies we talked about, but the most practical way to build more stores faster is to diversify to be a multi-brand, multi-location operator. Uh, let's talk about uh, the restaurant and tax incentives. Um, we have long taken advantage of something called Section 179 Accelerated Depreciation. Every time you build a store, a certain portion of that capital investment 
uh, focusing heavily on the equipment, if I recall correctly, uh, gave you the opportunity to create depreciation that would shelter the income created by those stores. The problem with sector, Section 179, accelerated depreciation, is that you were only allowed to bring your store to zero income. You couldn't pass through excess losses to the ownership or to the partners. Well, if you're operating in a partnership or an LLC, Section 179, as is illustrated here on the, the 2017 column, will allow you to combine the uh, 179 accelerated depreciation with bonus depreciation. Now, bonus depreciation up until last year, before the new tax law took effect retroactively, was limited to only 50% of certain parts of the investment that you made. But it still was a hugely compelling driver. Even a store that deployed in 2017, and we deployed some, could create significant loss carry forward. And that, if you have a store that's producing, um, let's say, $100,000 or more in income each year, and you can take this loss for a tax purposes against it, you literally mitigate the taxes for that store and it allows you to continue to recycle that capital that you're earning. Well, the amazing part that happened in 2018, when the new law passed in first quarter, it was actually one of the few retroactive effects of it is that if, if you put a store into service in 2017 after a certain date in September, which we happened to put one store into service in late September, early October, and we bought a couple stores from a franchisee to add to our portfolio, which counted as deploying capital, well, we were able to take the new tax cuts and job tax bonus depreciation, which is equal to, um, excuse me, 100% of our equipment and ff &E package. And on top of that, we were able to take the same, combine that with the Section 179. And in effect, we protected the income created by those stores and ended up generating per store up to $350,000 in loss carry forward. That will literally uh, tax shelter the income from each store for up to two more years. So that is effectively tax-free income that the government wants you to use to build another store. Um, when we get together in February for the deep dive event, Steve Brockman will join us and he will go deep on this topic and explain how to do it. What uh, my objective is for today, excuse me, is to uh, give you guys an opportunity to uh, uh, go out to your tax advisors uh, and go out to your financial advisors or your CPAs and research this. This should keep you awake at night. This is game changing from an investment strategy perspective, but we believe if you have the opportunity to leverage your capital this efficiently, then if you want to build more stores, then that's where we potentially have an opportunity together to double down and diversify to a couple of brands. Um, I actually missed a poll. I'm going to go ahead and run it if you guys can play along since everybody in the audience is friendly today. Um, I forgot to run this poll. So if you guys could indulge me and take your guess. Now, you already heard the answers to the test. But let's see if everybody can participate. Click those fingers and exercise the poll. I'll try to get it in the right order on the next one. Um, how much of a new store investment can be the first year write-off or the loss carry forward? I guess we can call this a pop quiz. How much do you think when you put out a half a million dollars into a store and you begin to operate it at the end of that first year, how much of that can you take literally as a tax write-off? Thanks everybody for voting. There's just a couple folks left. Hey, we got 100% this time. So I guess we're considering this a post-mortem test. There we go. Uh, we still have two folks thinking it's only about 25 or up to 50. Uh, again, I appreciate your indulgence, guys. And the, the truth is that it is actually up to 100%. There are actually some scenarios. I spoke with Steve this morning. There are certain scenarios where you can literally create more tax write-off than the actual invested capital, uh, but it has to do with the whether you bought or, or acquired or how you came into that store and how you put it into service. So coming up, in, uh, watch for the invitations. We'll have an event. I believe that event will be in January, and uh, we'll do a deep dive on that topic. Let's see. Uh, Steve asked me to pass on to everybody. Uh, let me close the poll for a second. Oops. 
right? As a result, um, pass on to everybody that if you are in this and you are in tune to these topics, the rule of thumb is you're, you want in your business to take advantage of the Section 179 tax write-offs, then you take advantage of, sorry, you take advantage of bonus depreciation first, then you take advantage of Section 179. And in Steve's words, as long as you keep building a couple stores every year, the depreciation will literally protect your income across multiple stores, depending on how you're structured. So what I'd like to do is let's talk about alcohol in the fast casual space. Um, the fast casual space is the single fastest growing segment of the market today. I'm going to do a little deep dive on a couple of these charts, but the, uh, the net of it is that across limited service restaurants and menu restaurants, uh, the classic you know, freestanding, you know, uh, folks that you see out there or the family style restaurants and with full waitresses and such, the, those businesses categorically have been static with the exception of the very high end steakhouse category. Their year over year sales have been nearly flat. In the fast casual space, what we're seeing here on the top left is we are seeing literally, um, Eight and nine percent annual growth rate in the number of stores being created. It's not so much in store same source sales. It's in the number of units. Um, and everybody on this call is probably familiar with a couple of brands that are just tearing it up in the fast pizza space. Um, and of course, there's the legacy brands in the Mexican space. Part of the reason we're here and we're inviting you guys to these events is that those top name brands are largely licensed out. There aren't opportunities to go develop markets with them because they've sold much of their markets and much of the prime market. So the difference with us is we have an opportunity for people to take on entire states or regions or markets and go develop those markets. Um, part of doing that is, excuse me, uh, is having a concept that can take advantage not only of the growth, and the growth is being driven by the fact that within fast casual, it's all about fresh food, fast food, affordable food, massively customized food. But the, in order to retain those customers, and excuse me if I back up, excuse me, in order to retain those customers who come shifted over from the table service menu-driven concepts, we have to move into the ability to offer alcohol. Um, many of us, uh, many of the folks on this call, may be involved in concepts where you have bottled beer, or wine, and cider, which we've had in our operations for a long time. But those, uh, the result of having that was not remarkable. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. I have a quick survey for you. But the point of alcohol and fast casual is the customers are moving into fast casual, but to retain them, to keep them from reverting back to the full service alcohol restaurant, for date nights, for family nights, for parties and entertainment, the concepts that are embracing alcohol as a in a, a full option way, draft beers, wines on draft, or wines by the bottle, mixed drinks, they are retaining the customers, and I want to talk about some of those benefits. Before I go on to the next step, excuse me, I'm having a little issue with my mouse. There we go. I have another poll for the audience. So in your current business, what percentage of your store sales are alcohol? And I realize some of you may be in states where it's impossible to get a liquor license or it's cost prohibitive. Um, but for those of you who do have alcohol available to you and can get a liquor license and operate effectively, um, what type of, uh, what percentage of your sales actually are driven by alcohol? I think we got almost everybody voted. There we go, 100%. Thank you, guys. So the less than 1% is exactly the kind of experience we had for, uh, Ray, I think it's almost approaching a decade of having bottled beer and wine. Um, having the bottled stuff that was behind the counter in a case, or in a little cold case, or a bucket of ice out front, like I've seen in some other brands, literally resulted in about 1% of sales being driven by those bottled products. And the challenge with that is the cost of your liquor license and your insurance and the staff certifications and everything that goes with it absolutely outweighed even the revenue, let alone the profit created by those products. Driving the alcohol to up to 15% of sales is a common threshold that has uh, always been a part of full-service restaurants with waitresses and bartenders. 
And what we're going to talk about is how you can actually achieve those kind of results. I'd like to uh, have a little fun real quick before we jump into how to do it, uh, and let's talk. I'm going to try a new technique that I'm not sure if I'm able to do it, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, this is a video. Um, this particular video had over 30,000 views and went viral. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in our social media uh, segment in a second, but this is a video of a customer literally pouring their own beer. Um, let's see if I can pull off this uh, sharing feature. And I'm going to try to run this video for you. Here we go. And then put your oh. and then you should put your cup right into it. Yep. And then pull back hard. And then push forward hard when you're done. Right. And like I said, you can get as much as you want or as little as you want. This guy's a pro. First one. Strange. Look at that. Cool, so you're famous it's, now, man. And it's done, and it's, it's going to show you that you have four that six and, four, and you have 17 more or so. There you go. That's, That's pretty amazing. cool. What was your name? My name's Cody. Cody, thanks, yeah. man. Appreciate you stopping in. Yeah. <laughs> that are panelists with me, um, I make sure that we can get back to the main screen. There we go. Now we're doing back on the main screen. Um, the uh, uh, excuse me, Atlanta, Darren, were you able to see the video? Okay, just a quick check. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we were. I was able to see the video. It went. It went dark for a minute, but then it came right up, and then it played actually really well. So that was good. That was a good experiment. Excellent. So. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, glad to be able to try it. Uh, let's see. So um, the alcohol. Excuse me. I'm losing track of where I am. Oh. So let's talk about what that alcohol does. So self pour alcohol is a completely new concept. It's been around technically. Darren will tell you about seven years. Um, the uh, transformation of the industry didn't happen overnight like a lot of partners in the space thought it would, uh, but now it's beginning to happen. Darren, uh, how many uh, taps, as you call it, of self pour alcohol do you guys have around the nation now? Uh, currently, iPort has roughly 3,600 self-serve taps in the market across the U.S., uh, and, and that is in markets anywhere bet between uh, tap, tap rooms all the way to urban living and everything in between. Got it. Thank you. And in our markets, we were the first one probably within 500 miles to deploy this, and look what happened. I want to share some data that Darren and the team helped us prepare, uh, and I'll put it in context real quick. Um, in our business in QSR Fast Casual, we typically site stores based on a baseline service area of about two miles. That core uh, residential and employment base is what drives lunch and dinner. Uh, we find that in big small towns, like in this example of Bowling Green, which really characterizes many of our markets in the stores that I operate and the stores throughout the brands that I'm a part of, Excuse me, in many cases they're big small towns, so we also look at the greater service area of five miles. And that's because they're gonna to have to drive to another town to get there. In a suburb, you gotta really live by the people that are two miles away. What we uh, learned from Darren as we researched this process is that the service area for self poor systems, because they are remarkable, because they're new, uh, because they will spread virally on social media, and we believe we maybe have a, a couple year head start before all the other players in the industry start to adopt them, but it's about 15 miles. So our little, our store in its small town of, you know, give or take 30 odd thousand people in the greater service area in the mid 30s is actually drawing customers 15 miles away for the alcohol. And we know this because we capture enough data to understand where they came from. So our store that was just a big small town store, if you notice in this top right heat map, kind of use a little bit of an eye chart, but it is suddenly drawing people in from all the way up in the Toledo suburbs and way out into the surrounding areas. And you'll see that in this second heat map. Um, on the left, I've reproduced the same two, five, 15 mile uh, Esri chart. On the right hand side, these green spots um, don't represent people, they represent the zip codes from which people are coming. And we are literally pulling people from a town that is a 25 minute drive from our restaurant and very similar drive times out into the countryside. 
when we deployed that self core system that you saw a moment ago, I actually spent nearly three weeks in the store meeting the customers, talking about it, as you saw in the video, showing them how to do it. And literally, customers were telling their story. People were finding us on a web application called Untapped. We've been talking about that in social media. But we're finding this, they will drive a great distance for something remarkable. But something even more important happened. People are staying a little longer in the restaurant. Our carryout percentage is trending downward. So they're spending more time, and they're, we're seeing, um, excuse me, substantial increases in dollar per ticket. I think for everybody on this call, being able to drive up your dollar per ticket really, really matters. Uh, in our particular case, we saw something around the range of a dollar fifty per ticket. In a QSR business, a fast casual business, it's arguably in the ten or eleven dollar range. We saw, as I described, the draw distance change, and we we approach this with a modular idea so that we can deploy this with our own operations. We can retrofit our operations, which I'm doing to a couple of my stores, and to make it easy for our franchisees to deploy as a component of their business. On, on a future call, Darren will do a deep dive and we'll talk about how the bracelets work and how the technology works. But suffice to say, this is not just a beer system. There is wine, there is uh, ciders are extremely popular. Um, and Darren, when we have a, a subsequent call, he will actually get into uh, why wine matters, uh, the opportunity to put cold pressed coffee and kombucha and craft sodas and uh, as we plan our um, our hothead cantina version of our restaurant, this is actually a repertoire piece that's been retrofitted, but as we build our new hothead cantinas, our intention is to offer a, a selection of beers and wines that are you know appropriate in a Mexican restaurant format. And I know Ray has been a big advocate because he's a fan of them too, is making sure we have interesting cocktails, mixed drinks. Uh, Darren, could you talk just for just a touch on the what's available in the cocktail space? This is not just beer. No, it's not. And you, you, you know, you talked about wine. You talked about cider. We have some demographic data that really um, lays out a strategy for how you use various products to uh, increase not only your patron experience but your um, across the demographic draw. Um, some of our locations are using. Uh, mixed drinks uh, to pour through our uh, through our system. Uh, mixed drinks are anything from a Moscow Mule to a to a margarita, and those mixed drinks, as long as they do not have pulp or any kind of sediment uh, in them, they can be easily drawn and uh, sold through uh, the self serve technology of iPourit. Thank you, Darren. What I'd like to do with that is, uh, Dan, we'll come back for a deep dive. I believe that's going to be our February session. We'll talk about how we do it, why we do it, the strategies for doing it, and uh, we really appreciate the uh, kind of information he can share. Um, and uh, I'd like to transition now to the real estate topic. Uh, let's talk about locations. Um, I'm showing you on the screen uh, what we prefer today are end cap locations. So we've been at this for a long time. Uh, and I, I like to say, even though they weren't my stores, I was around them, but in the subway days, and we know many subway operators that are friends of mine, subway was very common to take the, the inline center locations. All you wanted to do was to be in a big shopping center, a daily needs anchor, in a good part of town, and that mid-center inline space was fine. What we have found is that those end caps have literally outperformed the inlines as much as 50%. The challenge is that uh, it's very difficult to be the person who gets the call when the new shopping center goes up. So the opportunity to get income or end caps is one of the constraining factors in the expansion of our brand, which is why we began to explore built to suit partnerships last year. Um, I'll talk about those more in a minute, but and I would also touch on the fact that in our world, we have some freestanding restaurants, but we found that the the financial commitment to buy the land or build the building or have someone build us for it is not necessarily the right decision when you're competing in a space where your stores are million dollar stores or million, million five. Um, they may make sense for those other giant national brands with media backing, but they don't make sense for us. We found that the end caps do really well. What I'd like to do is a, a quick poll for the audience one more time and let's talk a little bit about locations.
what is the limiting factor in your growth in your business? At the beginning of the call, some of you guys identified yourselves as multi-unit operators or multi-brand operators. And uh, for those of you who are uh, new to franchising, thinking about getting the franchising, anybody on this call and certainly uh, uh, the folks on the panelists would advocate that if you get into the franchising business, you want to build multiple stores. It's about a portfolio business. So for those of you who have a few stores or a lot of stores and are trying to grow your business, what is the primary limiting factor? And thanks for voting. I appreciate it. It's just a couple folks left. But what's the primary limiting factor that's keeping you from building more stores? We're going to talk about how to solve a couple of these things. We've got almost everybody voted. 67%. We've got a holdout on there. I'll go check them. Next. All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, participating in the polls. And that's the classic one. The answer at the top is one of the most common ones I hear as I travel the country over the last year, meeting with folks that had large collections of restaurants, 50 restaurants, 100 restaurants or more, is that they, one of their anxiety points was, yeah, Chris, I'd love to get involved in another brand, but I don't know where I'm going to put the stores. Um, having limited capital to invest is something that we can solve uh, together with some of our partners in real estate and capital investment because I've spent my career in capital markets. Uh, I've been uh, participating behind the scenes in our brands for many years. What really brought me in all in was my son, Ross, who's on the call, uh, coming out of the military a few years ago and jumping into a multi-store plan. Um, and we can talk in a future session about um, how valuable it is to be able to invest in your management team and back them in stores. But if you're limited on your capital, there's ways to do it if you have the operating foundation in the base, uh, we can help you solve those capital limitations. We can also help you solve not enough good locations. And the operational capacity to build the stores goes to a point that a mentor of mine, Dan Carney, who's the founder of Pizza Hut and a dear friend of my father, uh, when we started talking to Dan last year about building um, small shopping centers to accommodate a couple of end caps with our stores in them, he told me that if we solve the conundrum of getting the store built and open, that it would change the game for franchising as an industry. Because the, and I think Ray would tell you that one of the greatest challenges for franchisees is getting a store open. Uh, Ray, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Oh, Sorry, I had to get back yeah, to that mute yeah, button there. <laughs> no, no that, that's all right. That's the challenge of Vanna. It, would you would you agree that as you know as a franchise or with a bunch of franchisees coming on, um, what are your thoughts about getting stores built? The process it takes to support people and the, the risks and, and challenges of that about getting them open. Yeah, I mean clearly the the biggest issue is, is finding you know great locations. Uh, you know a couple years back it wasn't as hard. Now it's uh, being more difficult. We have a great economy and and the real estate market has tightened up quite a bit. So uh, I would say probably the biggest challenge is getting um, a great location. And then obviously right after that, you know, you you uh, work through, you know, getting all your permits and things like that. But real estate is uh, it's the biggest challenge and the most important decision you'll make is where you're going to put that store. Yep. And, and then the process of getting that store built out, like my son Ross parachuted out into the military into his first store opening, having never had a store, never worked in a restaurant, um, he literally uh, landed in his exit orders 60 days before we opened, and Ray's team at corporate literally was the training wheels that helped him go through that store opening and have a barn burner of a store, and a store that to this day is one of the best performers in the system. Uh, let's see. I'd like to talk for just a second about... The advantage of having a couple of brands. So build the suit partnerships are not a new concept. There's many companies that will build you a building uh, that come from the tier one brands or they built Rite Aids and, and you know Walgreens stores and things like that. But the the challenge is to to attract their attention and get them to help put up good locations on available uh, parking lots or dirt or uh, high service areas or high traffic areas is a huge capital commitment. And they don't want to build one or two stores for you. They want to build for people who are building dozens per year. What we found is that we have opportunistically over the years had landlords contact us when they're in the planning phase, like I've depicted here on the left, 
um, and have the opportunity to plan our stores into the center. Well, one of our bankers a couple of years ago said to me, Chris, why do you keep going out and leasing spaces from other landlords and fighting for it when you could just build your own building? You have two brands. So if you are a multi-unit operator, I'm not suggesting you start building buildings. What I'm suggesting is if you have uh, another brand that you operate with a stable operating team in a particular market, you have the opportunity to leverage that operating team, clip on a couple more brands that are very easy to scale, easy to repeat, and now, if you take your current brand plus these brands, you have the tenants for a building. It's because you can bring the tenants to the developer, we're going to do a real estate session, I believe, in March, and we'll do a deep dive on how you can take away what Ray said, that number one constraint is finding good locations, because there really is good dirt available. There's good asphalt parking lots available. And if you, have, if you can take two of the tenant spots in a building, there are people who will build that building for you. And that's part of our key strategy for expanding this year. So yeah, I would challenge you to think of over the holidays is that, you know, if you, if you uh, have the capacity right, or if you're actively considering other brands, think about what it would mean if you could take two or three spaces in a building. And, and I like to say our brands were developed by a subway guy to be easy to operate for subway people. And uh, we have a very simple to operate brand in the Hothead Burritos, which is very, uh, let's call it, and I keep referring to Subway because it's so ubiquitous, but very streamlined and easy to operate. We have the Rapid Fire brand, which is more like a finely tuned sports car and a larger staff, but it brings two different concepts. And we found over the years, as I talked about earlier in this session, that if you put uh, a Hothead next to a Subway or a Rapid Fire next to both of them, they all do well. So there is a huge opportunity if you embrace a multi-unit, multi-brand strategy to have real estate partnerships. And part of what we do here at Wiley Development is we facilitate those relationships so that you don't have to build buildings. You concentrate on uh, operating them. Um, we have other partners. Uh, we've been in this business a long time. Uh, we have folks like Freddie Steakburgers, who are family friends out of Wichita, one of the old Pizza Hut families. Um, we have folks we've met through our own area development teams who are in about 10 states, uh, folks like Duck Donuts. The, interestingly enough, Duck Donuts is thrilled to be the middle unit. They're happy to be adjacent and sandwiched between a couple other food concepts. Uh, we have uh, concepts like First Watch, which dominates as a super regional in the southeast and uh, kind of uh, Texas through the southeast. Uh, breakfast places, they fit well. Um, they want the end caps, which we can do a little negotiating on. But the point is, what I'm doing at Wiley Development is we have these friendly partnerships where if we can find an opportunity in a market where we can get a, a small shopping center, we have partnerships who will build the center and we can get our stores in and co-locate with other franchisors who are cooperating and like us, they're in the battle for great location. Our coverage today, as I mentioned, is around 10 states. In many cases, our area developers, the ones states that are in gold, are already out there and the support system is being established so that people can take on our stores with that regional support. Part of what my team does here with Elena and, the, and other team members, and Ned, is we help support area developers who are considering coming into our brand. There's a lot of folks that we talk to who uh, are in a different brand of quick service or other sort of fast food, and they're simply an operator. And they've matured, they're like us, you know, they're not 30 years old anymore, and they're looking for an opportunity to actually control the market. So one of the things we help with is not only, um, you know, the, the capital and financing arrangements uh, or the build to shoot partnerships, but we can help people get engaged in the opportunity to actually control the development in their state for one or more brands. With that self-promotional message out of the way, I'd like to talk for just a second. Uh, I kind of, there we go, lost my mouse. Got another poll for the audience. I want to segue to our final topic, which is social media. And let's talk about marketing. So for those of you in the audience, get those mouse fingers ready. Uh, what is your primary form of marketing? Um, are you relying on something that we've done for many, many years and still do every day today, and that's direct mail and couponing? Um, do you have the budgets in your current brands? 
uh, for major media. Uh, we do love billboards, by the way, but TV and radio is a stretch for all of us. It can consume a lot of capital. Um, we have come to understand the power of social media really in the last 18 months. We've seen that impact in our business in a positive way. And even though this is not exactly a social media topic, the third-party delivery services are, in fact, marketing organizations. And talk about what that means to our businesses potentially. Thanks for you guys who voted. And I can see that there's a lot of people in the audience that are like us. Uh, Ray likes to say you got to keep mailing pictures of food to customers to bring them through the door. And we do. We mail a lot of pictures of food. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, we have not uh, made large investments in the radio TV kind of world. We've certainly experimented with it. But without the benefit of being the, you know, the high density of some of the tier one brands, that's just too, it, it's almost unaffordable. What we're finding is that social media is becoming the, uh, really the major media of this time, and it's not just for kids. We have massive data acquired on the customers who interact with us, excuse me, and, uh, excuse me, oh, that data is telling us that it is both young people, kids and millennials, but it's, it's retired people. I mean, grandma and grandpa are finding us on Facebook and coming in and redeeming the coupons. They have time to goof around with that stuff. Those videos I mentioned earlier, that particular video of the first customer at the beer wall, literally got 30,000 views because it was shared all over the planet in our region. And uh, we'll talk in a minute about the uh, third-party delivery. We've embraced it cautiously. There's a lot of issues with it. But what it has done, it has become a material part of our business. I'll show you in just a moment. So for us, social media has become a major uh, force to be reckoned with. I think if we go back 18 months or so, uh, we were just starting to understand, you know, we had to have Facebook pages for all our stores. We always had websites for our stores. But as those uh, Facebook pages began to grow traffic and uh, Pete on the call has dedicated team members literally working the social media all day, every day. We have watched as our interactions with customers and across our system, and I say our system, the family brands, uh, Rapid Fire Pizza and, and Hothead Burritos, we have about 100 locations. The result of 100 locations is literally hundreds of thousands of interactions with patrons, um, everything from comments, uh, posting the uh, certainly our fair share of complaints, uh, and we'll have a, we can talk about that. We will talk about complaints and mitigating complaints, and um, and overcoming that very fraction of a small group of customers who complain about everything, and encouraging that majority of your customers who are thrilled with your product to actually tell other people through social media. And I brought up the topic of the third party delivery, mobile and online ordering through our own direct mobile apps and our own POS system has become a material part of our business, but it had the collateral benefit of giving us access to those customers and their email address and making them much more intimate. What I want to talk about is if now that you have this audience, which you can see from the chart on the bottom, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse back on the screen. You can see from the chart on the left, it's age groups, it literally uh, the core age group is 25 to 34, but it includes people, as I said, up to parents and grandparents. It is a highly interactive audience, and you've got to work it. What's not obvious is what it takes to work it. One of the things that's not apparent in social media is that um, we built, and I'll come to the mobile in a second, is that we built our website so that uh, our corporate team is constantly posting very interesting content. Um, we're, you know, it's pictures of food, it's stories, it's pictures of customers. It's driving great traffic in terms of recommendations and reviews and positive experiences. Um, we'll talk in a uh, our session in April or March, uh, March or April, with our social media uh, team led by uh, a consultant named Matt Clapp. Uh, Matt wrote the book called Don't 86 Your Restaurants. Um, he literally wrote the book on how to employ social media marketing in your business. But what we have learned from our relationship with Matt and a pilot over the last six months with a large number of our stores is that we thought we were doing fantastic uh, things and we were doing great things, but it turned out some of the things that we were doing that, uh, uh, such as posting great pictures of food, such as posting simple promotions, 
it turns out that the way the social media works is not the way you think it works. That's why I say our theme and the takeaway today is uh, it is not, everything is not as it seems. If you are simultaneously posting, and here's a takeaway, if you're simultaneously posting the same content to all of your stores, which by the way, there are technology platforms that we utilize that allow us to create one great picture of pizza and put it on 30 restaurant Facebook pages. It turns out that Facebook's algorithms actually um, are negatively impacted by that. They actually uh, restrict your how many people see those posts because they see it as commercialized content. They see it as something that is uh, made specifically to promote the business, which is paradoxical because they're business Facebook pages. But we're going to tell you when we do the deep dive in March or April with Matt and watch for those invitations, we're going to tell you some secrets that about how you can mix up the way you post and the type of content you post and when you post it so that it is always treated as unique and interesting from the world of Facebook. Um, a collateral benefit of getting customers engaged through your Facebook pages and driving them continuous interesting videos, stories, polls, promotions, and coupons is that then you also start to really drive your mobile interaction with those customers. The mobile interaction from our own coupons, from our own mobile ordering, from our own online ordering, has literally helped to grow uh, our day parts in the bottom right side of the screen. We're seeing orders coming in before the stores open for offices ordering food. We're seeing later evening orders coming in because it's a combination of things. They can order from their home. They don't have to come to the store. And to the uh, chart on the left, We've seen DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub and Amazon in certain markets. Suddenly, the customer that would have come through the door is ordering on their mobile device, and we're getting the orders through those guys. Now, I pointed out that the third-party delivery, if you have not embraced it, is actually an advertising mechanism. You are featured there. You can run couponing and promotions there. We have some stores that do so much business through that, there's a second make line just for the social media. And by the way, that this whole um, phenomena of third-party ordering, third-party delivery, and the, that becoming a huge part of our business is something where we think our brands shine. Uh, we are built for speed in both the Hothead brand and the Rapid Fire brand. And you know we're in a customer-facing business. We're making the food to order, which is what customers want. They're watching you do it. They're picking the products. The dilemma is, in that environment, Many, many restaurant concepts are, are very negatively impacted. If you have a line of customers and you're facing them and you get a, an online order for 20 pieces or 20 burritos, you have to stop working on the food in front of your customer, and that creates a problem. Well, Ray, and, Ray learned about these things as we designed Hothead and is later, and we redesigned and enhanced the design, and as we deployed the Rapid Fire brands, and our stores are built to handle the online ordering, which is in some stores as much as 20% of our daily revenue, and do it without impacting the customer service in the store. If you're going to do social media, you have got to measure it. You've got to manage it. And this is just an example of a dashboard where we absolutely keep track of um, our organic reach, how many people are seeing it. Now, we, we did a comparison. Pete and I, who runs the social media, or runs media and technology for the brand, as my partner, Wiley Development Group, we started to look very uh, deep uh, analysis of how social media compares to television advertising or to a mail drop. And what the, uh, the jury is still out, we're still in a, a grand experiment and we're investing a lot of time and resources. But what appears to be the case is that if you're mail dropping coupons to 50,000 people, it has a particular cost and a particular redemption rate. If you are using social media to cause our story or our picture or our funny video of the day to pop up on somebody's Facebook page, not only does it count the person who saw it, and I know they saw it, but it also, I know who that person was if they opt into my reward system. So rather than blindly dropping coupons on my same customers every month, like we've been doing forever and everybody does, now I can target the customer um, who uses my product, I can bring them back. I can I can try to tease them with a variety of products. Uh, you know, if you were to look at our sales mix in our pizza stores, uh, salads barely register. 
and maybe you know people don't think of us for salad, but calzones were a brand new product, and we managed to run calzones up to a material part of business. Can you think of any other uh, pizza operation in the planet where you can get a calzone in three minutes? Well, through our social media, through the stories about it, through the targeted couponing, we were able to uh, create the awareness and cause people that, that we had in our customer set and in our reward system to come in and redeem. So if you're going to do social media, the big takeaways I, I implore you with and it should keep you awake over the holidays, if you are simultaneously posting to all of your stores or if your franchisor that you are a part of has a, let's call it, simplified view of social media and it's everything the same everywhere, that is actually hurting you. If you are not creating new organic content, quick videos, fun interactions, customer photos, and reviews, if you're not doing that every single week at every single store, you are squandering the opportunity that is Facebook. So um, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, this is like an entire channel of business that has to be managed. We're proud that uh, you know in our stores, we're embracing it. I know as a franchisor, Ray and his team have been embracing it and experimenting with it. Come back and join us in March or April. We'll do a deep dive on these topics, and you can learn about how to do it, why to do it, and what not to do. Um, we are just about to the uh, end of our uh, session. I think, uh, I think, excuse me real quick, I think I have exhausted all of our polls. And excuse me, just a quick word about us. Um, we are a store operating company. The reason we're putting on the events is because it's part of our world to manage partnerships, real estate development, capital, financing, we help people become part of the rapid fire pizza system or the hothead burrito system. We are ourselves franchisees and some of our team members actually have areas where they are the area developers. Um, we look forward to the opportunity to work with the folks who are on this call, um, whether you come to this as an operator, as an area developer in your own right, if you're just an investor in the real estate or in the businesses, there are opportunities across the United States as I've depicted on that map for us to work together. But if nothing else, if we can build some rapport together and you join us in January, February, March, and April, we'll do the deep dives on these topics and we'll publish a lot more information to make it fun. Uh, with that, I'm gonna leave, try just for uh, giggles, I want to, I have one more little video to share uh, that I think I get a kick out of. Let's see if I can make my time-lapse video run on the screen. This is one of the first ones that I ever remember from our Rapid Fire brand. Locations, capital, growth, and opportunity. I'm going to check real quick before we finally wrap up. Uh, I wasn't noticing if we had any uh, questions or chat. Uh, Elena, is there anything that we need to address uh, no. before we wrap up? Yep. I did not see anything, but everyone has still been attentive. We've ma maintained the same number of people, but no, we haven't had any questions. So, But if anyone has awesome. any at the end, uh, please let me know. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate the internal team members playing along. And for those of you who joined us from the outside, uh, thanks for joining our preview event. And uh, watch for the invitations coming for January, February, March, and April to uh, hit the topics that we talked about. Uh, we'll do the deep dives on tax incentives. We'll do a deep dive on uh, fast casual market and how alcohol is a tipping point. Uh, we'll do a deep dive in the next month on locations and the uh, all the things we can do to help you get locations. As Ray said, that's the biggest challenge in the business. And last but not least, social media with Matt Platt. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to close the session now.